All right, good evening everybody. It is uh, Monday, March 20th, 2017, and this is the Curriculum and Instruction Committee meeting. It's 5.33 p.m., and let's just go around the table and everybody can state their names. Dane Oaks O'Neill. Connor Kurtz. Dave Raskep. Rob Hurley. Jenny Barstow. Shelly Mikowski. Megan Weber. All right, great. Um, there are currently no members of the public, but if anybody shows up and wishes to speak, you know, they're free to do that. Uh, first up on the agenda, and Mr. McKnight has just walked in, uh, Act 138, Student Attendance. This is uh, yeah, Rob's presentation. presentation. Um, what we have, Act 138, um, We'll put new requirements and um, some more requirements from schools in regards to uh, student truancy. Um, it, it's going to require that in writing, uh, we and a lot of our schools do this already because it's good practice um, in terms of when a kid is truant, doing a behavior intervention plan with them and formalizing a meeting with the parents. Um, there are also some potential child fine implications down the road um, with special education. If a kid's truant and we know it and we meet, we don't act upon it, um, that can, it, it does put us in a little bit of a, a situation there. One of the other interesting things about Act 138, it formally puts it in writing it that, and mandates this, that um, any cyber school students, uh, for example, that we pay tuition for, it goes to Pennsylvania Virtual Cyber School, um, it, it formalizes the fact that we have to then take them to court and um, if the kids are truant and things of that nature from the cyber school. What does that look like, being truant from the cyber school? Are they are they not putting in the hours, not putting in the hours. Um, as a matter of practice, we do that now anyway because they don't do it and the kids wouldn't be going there. But it's hours out of our day and we're already paying them and that formalizes that. Um, that's that's where the biggest pushback you're getting from school districts and everywhere else. It's an unfunded mandate because we're paying them this tuition fee for these kids and yet in return we still have to, we're doing things for them. Well, how big of an issue is truancy right now? Like, and how does it work? I know that if you miss 10 days, you get a letter sent to The truancy issue is that 10 days has, that's a different issue. It deals that's with different. doctor's notes. What oh. we're, basically, if the kid's unexcused or unlawful absent more than three days, um, they get certified letters from us by policy and law. And then um, if they continue to be truant, okay, then uh, we, we try, obviously, we're reaching out to the parents. We try to have, um, create plans to prevent the truancy from happening. I mean, if that's unsuccessful, ultimately, we take them to court over that. Um, when you when the 10-day reference you have does exist, and um, that's if it's regular absences. If the student's absent 10 days, they're required to provide medical documentation, not just a parent's note. That's what they're... But truancy is really unlawful absences after a kid gets to three days. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, uh, and I'll certainly let the principal speak to this also, uh, sometimes we find when we have these meetings, all right, the kids are losing their notes on the lockers and stuff like that, and that's what's happening there. Sometimes they're legitimate truancy cases is what we follow up and our assistant principal. Well, the question I guess is I'm wondering, so you miss three days, mm -hmm. and then if I miss a fourth, do I go to court? If I miss a tenth, do I go to court? Like, where do we draw the After three days district? unexcused, okay, after the, any continuous there, you, you can end up in court after there. Usually what we do is we have a meeting with the parents when they hit the three-day, so there is a little bit of transition time right yeah. there, but it's when a kid hits the three-day benchmark, our assistant principals are reaching out to them, and they're setting up meetings, and they're devising plan, written plans to address the truancy issue with the student and the family. Um, if our plans are unsuccessful, we take them to court at, at that point in time. So that's basically the way we handle that. And so is what it is. All right. So how is, and you, when we spoke on the phone, you said that Act 138, this is a change? Uh, it's a little bit of a change. There, there's so a couple. Have, there's, and there's specifically the change. It, it's formalizes it. We can't miss this process anymore. There's things that have to be put in writing now at this point in time, so there can't be any mistakes on our on our part. Um, the the Act 138, where the state's putting out a BEC on this shortly, um, but what it's going to do is it's, it's basically it's going to create a little bit of a window, I believe, between three and six days, you know, in terms of some time frames for us to get a truancy intervention plan in place. Um, it's formalizing a lot of the things that we do in form here right now, um, and it does create some potential legal obligations in terms of child find um, if we don't act, if, if we're unsuccessful in all of our truancy remediation effects, it could be a potential special education issue, um, and, it's, and we have to at least look at that as a possibility now. 
And uh, that was actually our biggest concern in, in regards to it as a district. But we're good. Everything is. Fine. We're going to be good, and we're working. We're going to. We're also going to update our policies, and we're working on that right now. And I've actually uh, assigned Mr. Repco to work on our policies to get them in accordance to this particular piece. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, next up, I had on here special education discussion. I think this was. When I had originally put this on the agenda or wanted to talk about it, I think it was specifically to talk about this uh, child fine. Like, how do we identify students who may need um, special services from the district or additional services? And then when we got the board update that um, I think, Dave, you had asked, like, what does this mean for us? I think that took on a case loops. Yeah, case loops. So if you can speak to those items. <laughs> well, we do have those eight case loads right now that are over the maximum. And what happened, this was our year to write the special ed plan because it went along with the comprehensive plan, but they delayed it. But the one piece that's still due by May is the updates on all of the classes across the district. Um, and what that's looking at is how many students are in that class and what is the age range because there are full regulations to both. Um, so it is a concern. In fact, today I, I just did files for four more students and I included in this week's update that we I have 63 referrals from now until the end of April and they just keep coming every day. And that was something else I was wondering um, and we were provided some data I believe by either Jim or Mr. Hurley or it may have been you yourself Mr. Mikowski uh, the um, referrals like how are they like why are we why do we have eight more why is our caseload eight over this year compared to other years? We have a lot of students in special ed. We have not we have not added um, teachers probably in the last eight years. While district enrollment is declining, which we see, you see, and, and I speak about that every year, and the numbers show special ed is increasing, and we have not increased staff. So, and know, why? Stretching. Like, why, why is it increasing? Is that because we're changing? Is that because the definitions are changing? Um, is it? I think I, I, I think it's a great discussion, and I really think it's time to look instructionally at what's going on and why all the students are getting ready. Well, that's one of the reasons. So, how do we find? How do we identify students? How do we identify? Yes. Students? Well, in a variety of ways. First of all, a parent can trump anything. So, if, it, if a building has a child process, whether they're using the break team or they're calling in something else, and that's what they're bringing students who are struggling, and then they're supposed to develop a plan and put interventions in place, um, and hopefully prevent that. Typically, we're not finding that. Or a parent can write a letter. And, you know, in some cases, teachers know that. So while principals might be saying, we really want this process to, to go in, in, you know, in its yeah. entirety, you know, let's try this with that student. A parent, a teacher can say to a parent at a conference, you know, all you have to do is write a letter. And all a parent has to do is write a letter and send it to me or send it to the principal, their guidance counselor, and say, I want my student tested. That trumps everything. Okay. He can't yeah. say, no, 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 we're going to try these interventions first. Yeah. So that's a way. Um, staff members can, can see things going on with students recommend to their principal or the guidance counselor. Well, if, how I see it then, if we have, like if the parent can say, I want my student tested, and that test comes back, I don't want to say positive, but the test comes back and indicates that there is a, a circumstance where we need to provide additional services, mm -hmm. then to me the system has has failed in that sense because we should have identified that without right. them. And I can tell you the majority of the times a parent makes the request that child doesn't qualify. Doesn't qualify, okay. Well, that's, uh, I, I guess that's good. Um, so, so legitimately, we, I mean, there aren't any cases out there where the, where the parents just want extra help for the kids and they're putting in because they say well, they have a special need. Right. We, are, we are able we to are. screen those out. Right. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, I saw some of the numbers in the class, like 20% of the kids. Mm -hmm. Some, the some of the grade level. levels. I was yeah. just like, wow. Now, our long-term average has been like 15, right? Right, that's like the state average, like between 15 and 16 overall in the district, but we're probably running 18, 19 percent. 
No, certainly not. Shall I speak to this? If we miss a kid in child find, and then it's determined four or five years later um, that they, you know, we should have found that kid through child find, that could, that's where we can get exposed for comp ed also. So that, that, that's what you have to think about in, in terms of those Right, right. You don't want to miss them. Not only it's not good for kids. But, but I think kids. instructionally there are things that can be done to change some of the students who are getting identified. Because there for a while we were seeing a lot of issues with executive functioning. Well, that's not some, and probably if we screened students who are not coming towards special ed, we would find issues there. Yeah. Because there's not, that's something that's not focused on or directly focused on. I think that's one of the pieces. Um, and I know Rob and I have talked too, when we don't do a, the RTI model, uh, response intervention to identify students with learning disabilities, but it is in place in buildings. But when you're looking at support, the special ed class is supposed to be your smallest classes because those are your most intense students. Well, that's not how our pyramid looks. Well, how does our pyramid look? Our pyramid probably looks, probably our reading, um, teachers probably have the least amount of groups. And you know, when they're not making it in a group of five, then they're qualifying for special ed and go into a class of 22, and they're in a reading group of 12. How is that better? It's not. Well, this is something that uh, we were provided today, or I was provided today, and I sent it out to the committee, um, a survey that was administered to teachers, and not just teachers, but all staff, I believe in the district, or all professional staff. And one of the recurring themes was special education. In the comments, um, this has been an issue. Uh, one teacher wrote that, for example, um, in a class of 22 students, there are three autistic and four learning support students in that class. And the... With, with the percentages, that's kind of yeah. almost yeah. where, yeah. you know. I mean, um, I don't know what, what they but, think is going to happen when you continue to refer students for special ed. You're, but I think I think one of the things I noticed was seeing some of the comments were that the learning support teachers weren't necessarily had the time to do what they're supposed to do because they're being pulled in different directions. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, that seemed to be a couple of the comments. See, and another thing you have to realize: school psychologists are doing the psychological testing initially, and sometimes every three years, if additional testing. But that's all they do. Not all they do. That's the majority they do. But when you're talking about our therapists, our speech therapists, our OT, our PT, and our special ed teachers, they're doing all of the testing. They're doing the progress monitoring. They're writing the IEPs, and they're supposed to be your students. Well, how can you do all that in that in that amount of time? When you have an IEP meeting and it might last an hour and a half, two hours, that's either time you you miss with your students. Or somehow you're going to make that up. How? How? There's only so, so many hours in the day. Plus, they're writing the documents, and there's no way they're doing that during the day. They're not. They have to do it. I, I can vouch for that. <clears throat> well, I think this is going to have to be. Uh, like, I didn't realize the issues that we were facing in, in special aid. Um, today, something that really hit home with me was when I was looking at these survey results. Um, the final question of this survey, before the open-ended, share your thoughts. Um, based on your experience, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statements about your school? And the final statement, there is adequate staffing in our special education department. Um, the folks who strongly agreed, there were zero. Uh, agree, 13. And there were over 70 staff who said um, they strongly disagree or disagree, and that disagree and strongly disagree is 85% of those surveyed, and that seems to be our weakest area right. by far. Um, so I'm not saying the solution is, you know, just to hire people. I think that that probably is part of the solution, but I think we need some type of, I don't, I don't want to say comprehensive, because I talked about that a lot in terms of the iPad issue, but some type, like, what, are we, what do you recommend we do for this? I think a solution, like a, a, a solution that would be something to start thinking about is to have an itinerant teacher service middle school, high school, and an itinerant teacher service elementary school. And that will pull some of those less needy students off those caseloads 
where a case manager can then write the IEPs and touch base with those students when they need to be, you know, they don't need a whole lot of support. They need somebody checking in on them, you know, maybe checking grades, providing some service during their study halls. What about the issue involving uh, the aides, special education aides? How uh, are, we, uh, are we satisfied? Uh, I am satisfied with, okay. with the number of special aides. Okay. The question I have is before we, we staff something, you know, I maybe mean, that is the right answer is what's the root cause analysis? If, we're, if our numbers percentage wise are outside the band, there's certainly going to be some staff outside the band from that number I saw today. Also, why is that? Are, you know, in, in Europe, and, and I'm not asking for an answer, Charlotte. Right. It's really a reflective question. That, how many of our kids really are meeting the criteria for special ed? I, as I once had one school say, not in this district, tell me, I can always find something wrong with the kid. You know, and then they get a label and so forth. Um, you know, what, you, you mentioned RTI and, and that we're not using, what is our universal instructional practice? Like, one of the things I would I wonder is, in, in the root cause analysis, would there be a teacher who's an outlier? who refers more kids than other kids. And that, that then is an instructional type issue, or it could be a curricular type issue. I mean, there's, there's a lot of analysis to me that, without being in the depth that you guys are in, that I would want. Um, you know, do we have, our, our, before we know if they're responding to intervention, what's the consistent and universal instructional or curricular or assessment patterns? Right. Then we know those kids are outliers, or is it a failure of the instructional design? Or the, Curricular designer. There's a lot of questions before we can get, to, in my mind, to, to those folks. But that's why we started. That was my one. Anybody else have anything on that topic? It seems like we're going to have to do some more digging and, um, but specifically, I guess through this issue of the eight caseloads, where we're over. What is the urgency of correcting yeah. that? Like, what are the Have repercussions? Be able to, to move some numbers, caseload-wise, I can sort of play with some of those. I don't know if I can get them all down to where I need to get them down. Okay. Well, while while Shelly's here, I thought I I'd ask, and this is just my personal uh, the, the project max. Um, I just I was a little uh, disappointed that we didn't hear about it before. I, I, I wasn't aware. Well, I wasn't aware we were doing it. You weren't. Yep. Mm -mm. We I said it in my board update. Dana and I both said it in our board updates. Probably. Yeah. You don't know. I never heard of Project Max. I mean, I might mean, have seen it, but I might not know what it is. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. we've been waiting to get it on wanting to present to the board, and we're waiting for a month. That we and yeah, you know, we're the only we were the only district that was doing it, and uh, mm -hmm. I even asked at the IU Thursday, and people I asked they even. Kind of, well, I kind of know what it is, but you have to talk to Dr. Wyoka because we all know what it is. She doesn't even know what it is. She hasn't been involved. So I'm, I'm like, okay, so I guess yeah. it was their special projects team that, that was helping you? Is that yeah, what? well, we have two external coaches from there. Yeah. yeah, it would be from the special services. Yeah, so it's just yeah, it good to hear, but you know, I was like, oh. <laughs> But fortunately, and like I, I had, while it's a name, it's not new to the end We've done okay. a great job. Oh, yeah. And more than have. including them, yeah. making them, you know, it's now it's a little bit more as part of the curriculum, but they, they always were. We used a stepwise program um, with some students. Like, we have a student in the high school. He's, he's been in biology, and he probably is functioning on a five-year-old level, reading-wise. He's, he's pretty low, but he's been out for grade-level English, and Teachers have done a phenomenal job, and in the middle school, adapting it. Now it's just pushed out, and it's just more, um, it's just changing. You know, moving our students are competent learners, which they are. All right. Thank you. Next up, curriculum and assessment updates. Okay, just some general updates for your information. Uh, the curriculums that are being written right now, uh, we have our AP Geography uh, AP Seminar, our middle school science curriculum in grade 6, grade 7, and grade 8 is, are being written. Our Spanish curriculum is being rewritten as we speak, and our French curriculum is being written, rewritten as we speak. 
Uh, more importantly, what's happened, we just finished our WIDA testing, which is our English as a foreign language, uh, or uh, English as a second language. That testing just got done, um, and we're going to hear a lot about this. Um, April was basically PSSA month, and we're in prep right now for that and getting everything ready um, for our PSSAs, which go through grades three through eight um, in math, reading, um, and then you have your science in certain grade levels, and that's quite a bonus thing. So um, that's what's going on from there. What's going on with um, the book situation? The textbooks, what you can see coming from, what you'll see coming from us very shortly is um, when we finish up with the middle school science, you're going to see a textbook order. Um, probably we're, we're shooting for next month, if not the following, um, and you'll have the textbook once the curriculum is completely finalized. It's almost there. We're working on it as we speak. Um, and we also have... We need to update, we have one a smaller order of uh, middle school, it's our last common core alignment textbook that we've just been stretching these out for budgetary reasons over years, um, but we need to get those instructions. Is still GoMath? What's that? GoMath? No, it's a different one. Than, uh, we, we'll talk about that. It's not GoMath, it's actually a different one. Are we not satisfied it's with GoMath? It's, it's, it's our last one uh, to get us aligned, um, get all of our materials aligned there. And so... Just the top of the chain? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you watch it. <laughs> We knew that, that's why. <laughs> uh, so, and that's what you really, uh, and your AP Geography textbook is going to be coming. Um, and the curriculum for AP Geography is, it is nationalized and standardized, so the, it, we have to formalize it, get it within our documents, but that's just tweaking on the wording, so you, you're probably going to get that before you see the formalized document, because the curriculum is nationalized and is standardized throughout the states, do we, um, and we have to actually, that. Do we know how many teachers. students are going to be in that course? Yeah, Megan knows for sure. I feel like we're at 14, is my, my recollection. Megan, is that right? Um, I feel like we're 14 there, and APU is like 23. Hmm. My, my and the only one, so of those four, well, were, you, were you hoping for a little more? I was. I really was. I, I think um, one of the things that AP Euro has right now over AP Human Geography is that we allow students to take AP European in lieu of ninth grade. So if you take it, you don't take ninth grade world history. Oh. Um, if you right now you're taking AP uh, Human Geography in adjacent, you know, in concert with that. So I think that there's only so many slots in that ninth grade right. space. Right. So, so you're saying that if I'm a ninth grade student, I can take either well. Either maybe and or I could take European history instead of the world cultures class, right. or I could take the human geography. Could I take both? Okay, you, you mix them up a little bit. Okay, All right, so Set me you straight. can take you can take a, AP Euro. Yeah. Instead of taking ninth grade world. Right. But you cannot take AP human geography instead of ninth grade world right now because we want this is the first year. Yeah. We need to see what the level of interest was and so forth. So that would be, be a phase two. So piece. this is a supplementary class. Then. Yeah, and we're kind of in a oh, pilot. Okay. I don't want to call it pod, just a phase one of AP Human Geography to, to have that teacher launch it. But I didn't know that we yeah. were offering that for ninth graders. Ge Euro, oh, yeah, that's I thought, the point. I thought geography, human geography would be for ninth graders. Well, we opened up AP to, to, to many students, and, and so what they have to have coming out of eighth grade is, is a recommendation a meeting with the teacher, a parent meeting. And there's a lot more that goes into allowing a student to do a ninth grade AP course. Right. It's a finite number of kids that can do it. And um, those are... Or even willing to engage the yeah. work ethic. So, um, Mr. Angle and Mr. Smolenski were over, and maybe it was last week, maybe the week before yeah, that. Yeah, two weeks ago they were over. To meet with the kids and talk to the kids about the expectations in the program. And, and so, yeah, but I was, I, you know, back to your point, Dave, I was hoping that we could maybe get around 25 to 30 kids in the AP human geography. I think we'll grow it, though. It usually starts slow and grows faster in most of these well, courses. I, my, think, my thought there is the idea of maybe a ninth grade taking two geography courses, and that is the um, ninth grade plus the human right. geography. That might be a little bit daunting for some folks. Right. So if we get yeah. to the point where we can offer them in lieu of. Um, but European history, that's available for ninth graders, tenth graders? It's all ninth and twelfth. Not all, okay. All right, great. I don't remember, Megan. Do you remember the number of ninth graders? I, I, I just read another report. How many of them? AP Euro ninth graders. Fifteen. Wow. Yeah. So that, that was the, they kind of say they went that way instead of the human yeah. geography way. Yeah, of the twenty-five so. who are enrolled, the fifteen. Yeah. Well, and you want to continue doing that? Could there be any wisdom to maybe saying that that course is for 10, 11, 12, and human geography is for well, nine? Well, you know, as you guys, and I think. You know, I'm a big advocate of choice and control for, for students. So if a student is a high interest in case, I'm, I'm a proponent of that. So yeah. if, if, if they choice not, and control, what that kind of... 
control over their life, their education, their way. Well, the, the, on that note, though, because I wish, like half of me wonders when I was that age, I, I really wish I could have taken those mm -hmm. courses. Of course, we didn't offer them when I was in school. But as an eighth grader, would I have been in a position to say, I, I want to do these things and I can achieve them? Or would I have been one of these students who said, you know, maybe I'm interested in this, but I'm not going to do it? Or I mean, my parents would, like, I... Well, we like, try to have a campaign. I mean, right, we're okay. with Jenny and, and that team to try to get down there. They, they have us in the building. We've been there. And not only this, but we were there one other time earlier in the year. And know, that's so, exciting. I'm really glad because yeah. for the longest time it was kind of mysterious, I think. And now if we're selling it to these kids, then there really isn't an excuse. Yeah. Not our next move uh, next, for next year, we, I wanted this year, but our next move would be to grow into the local fund to represent the population, kids of poverty, color, so forth. Um, and, and we'll have a, a concentrated effort. Um, AP College Board has a model to help you launch into those communities and, uh, and, and grow interest. So... Great. Even more Any luck getting your uh, your buses for uh, uh, Ms. Rexha is working hard. <laughs> she has she has a relationship we're gonna we're trade on here. So. Okay. Preston or Megan, um, do you uh, do you think that the big selling point for Euro instead of AP is that it is in lieu of the other I think it certainly helps. No question. Yeah. Okay, so you, yeah. you, you do think that yes. the reason that so many kids opted right. for Euro was so that they didn't end up taking I two. So. Because in ninth grade, they only that. take six and a half credits. So because of the activity period we have at the end of the day, the freshman mm -hmm. leadership network period at the end, that, that piece limits what they can do. So if you're going to now have to take an extra course um, above and beyond, it's just not that many spaces, then you may not be able to take an elective you, you really want to take, right. an right. or a, a music or something. There's only one ninth grade. All right. Well, that kind of, I mean, because that was one of the reasons well, no that I want to no, really I think next added. year we'll see a better, a better turnout there once we open, you know, that, that relationship up in terms of taking over the so. Right. But again, 16 ninth graders taking AP is, is a good number. Right. I think and it's a real badge of honor for us. That's 5%, and that's probably about right for ninth grade, between 5 and 8%. Of your ninth grade kids could challenge themselves at that level. And this is the highest number of AP Euro kids we have. In ninth grade, you only get Well, two. on AP Euro, though, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong here, because you know about this better than I do, but I remember reading that AP Geography was not set up for ninth graders. It's per more se. user friendly for ninth grade. Right. Yeah. AP Euro. Is AP Euro, like, that's a higher level, I thought, yeah. than. It's 10th grade usually. Okay. It's usually 10th grade. I mean, but we had ninth graders, to, kind of the model that's taking place right now with the AP Human took place with the AP Euro last year with ninth grade. We had some ninth graders taken, oh, okay. so now you can see it's picked up. And those were the kids who actually came down two weeks ago to talk to our kids. Right. Mr. Engel and Mr. Smiglins, he brought those kids who are ninth graders yeah. that are in the class to talk about it, too. So that was great. Yeah, it was three years ago we had two kids for AP and that All was right. it. So, it's great that we're even talking about having AP Euro and having AP Human Geography. So. All right, great. Something, Rob, though, I'd like to ask in the summer, and please, again, always correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember when I finished up, we finished up the school year, the textbooks would be collected, the teachers would make sure that we all returned the textbooks that we had checked out, and then they would um, pretty much be stacked on pallets, or they'd be stacked and they'd wait for the next school year, and then they'd be reassigned. Like, what do we do with textbooks in the summer? Is that what we do? We stack them up and... We, we inventory all the textbooks there. By the way, we could use inventory software, but that's another issue all the other um, But right now, we, we have some access databases we can use oh, yeah. to try to do it individually in individual buildings. Um, but nonetheless, basically, we collect it. We look at the teachers look at the conditions of the book. They look at... They keep spreadsheets right. on the kids, the kids, the condition when it came in, check it in. Where are those books? They have to tell us the number of... They have to tell us the number of textbooks that they had at the beginning of the year versus the end of the year. Um, any lost textbooks that are built, and so the uh, recovery of that sometimes doesn't happen to their seniors when they graduate, but uh, nonetheless, in terms of getting money back from them and stuff. But where do we store those textbooks? Like, are they just in, in the hallways at school? Or they no, they're in the classrooms, so generally speaking, locked cool. up in the teachers' closets. Because I, the reason I'm asking that, and if they're you know, spread out through all these classrooms, I'd really like this summer to go through the buildings and take a look at these books to see their conditions firsthand and to see the additions we're using. And because we hear complaints about the textbooks, not only are they ancient in some cases, which I believe, and they're falling apart, um, 
but I just kind of like to see that. You're more than I'm absolutely. Just, what, 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 sorry, absolutely. You, you, know, you can pick any room. We won't even guide you. You pick the room. You'll All right, <laughs> let's do that then. Um, and I hope that we're still not using textbooks in uh, elementary school. I know we had a Pennsylvania history book or a Pennsylvania geography book, and the governor, I think, at that time, it was listed as being like Governor Schweiker or something. I don't know. But we're talking about books. Uh, Just tertiary. Tertiary. Pretty creative at times. <laughs> Given the one to, I know the one to one hasn't officially been hasn't been voted on, but if the board votes to go the one to one route, are we just going to make do with? I mean, other than other than the triage replacements that we have to have. Right. So, so some of the things I can just speak to a little bit. Bob has you know broader issue in this, but in, in the more defined space. Um, the only books we'll be needing to purchase uh, in the short term, because we didn't, you know, we went with the staff model for the first year, um, is uh, Nancy Romaine, for example, reached out to me and said, given the trig enrollment, we're going to need about 20 to 30 secondary market books. It was just the enrollment. We have kids taking these courses. That's the only place where we see textbook costs. It's just a student interest or an increase in a level, and we've had a lot of students challenge themselves up, which is, is good. Um, but those are areas that maybe we're small roles before the now. Right? So we, we are not looking outside of human geography to buy any new textbooks at the high school. Um, now, the secondary books, um, you know, the secondary support books that the English readers and things like that, that's a little bit of a different story. Um, we'll probably be buying some of those this year, uh, but then going into the following year, um, you know, we'll be looking, once the students come online with their computers, we're we'll looking to load those on there, whether they're free or low fee uh, materials. Okay. We're going to try to honor very hard the uh, budgetary constraint that so we think we can get by with 25% of the cap. And I talked about the high school that we kind of use right. the textbook replacement. So we'll keep that cap at 25% of the high school. Now, that, that's not Rob's budget. That's the budget for the high school. The, yep. And just just so we know, for clarification, the, the middle school has, ten, like, you'll see they got a big number this year coming in for science because it's grade 6, grade 7, grade 8, and that is yeah, yeah. our expensive textbooks. Um, so that, that's not including your elementaries and, and your middle levels. Because yeah, you know, they are, they're still, they're not yeah, digital right now. So. Those books are in the budget, though, right? They are, we budget for everything. Yep. Great. Yep. All percent. Okay, anything else on... Curriculum and assessments. Good. All right. Um, career prep and BCTC discussion. This is something that we talked briefly about last meeting, um, talking about college bound and all that, which is important, and I think that that should be a, the priority. Um, I also mentioned that my philosophy toward all this is that we educate for the sake of education. It's not to put kids in jobs after graduation. It's not even to send kids to college. It's to learn for the sake of learning. Um, that being said, it's important that, you know, our, we're graduating students who, uh, we're matriculating students who, uh, if they're not going to go to college, they have some opportunities ahead of them. Um, and to that end, uh, I want to talk a little bit about BCTC and our own in-house career prep. And specifically, I'd like to come to some type of, um, consensus as to if we're going to embrace the BCTC and use it, um, more extensively, or if we're going to, if we have some issues with BCTC, and I've heard different things from different folks about BCTC is great, BCTC isn't as great as it's made out to be, um, and I heard that the issue was that a lot of students change their programs when they're at BCTC, so they end up finishing in Daniel Boone, and they don't, um, they don't have that license, or they don't have that certificate that they would have had had they stuck with the program they had at the outset. Um, so I know that Preston, you, this is a topic that you're interested in. I don't know who wants to lead the discussion, if it's Rob or Preston or who wants to speak to it. But the, um, well, Yes, it is a topic I'm very interested in because as of all the districts I've worked in, this is the leanest by far. So every penny that we spend anywhere, to me, I, I always, my last superintendent used to kid that I spent the money like it was my own. And I think here that's more important than ever. Um, and what I see in our relationship currently with BCTC is there's a lot of lost money, a lot of dead money, so to speak. So that's something, I, there are a lot of layers to this conversation. Um, I am certainly pro-career education. That's why we've connected with the Pennsylvania Innovation Network for the Pathways model. Um, there are ways to do it. But um, I'll just speak for myself. Rob may have a different opinion on this. I'm not sure. I mean, I think, I think we agree, but maybe different. That they have not been overly user-friendly to us. Um, we are the customer in that relationship. 
and there are a number of things that we've asked for, and a number of things that we've proposed that have really just kind of been, you know, shoot to the side. Um, so I don't really feel like we get good customer service from them. That being said, it is a phenomenal program, and it is a phenom there are phenomenal things out there for kids we who know that's what they want to do and know that's where they want to go. I mean, the facility is second to none, really. Quite frankly, Rob and I joke about this. Every time we look at their budget, their budget goes up. We need this much more from you. Well, we'd like to have some of those things here at this school, at our high school. She'd like to have some of those things in her middle school. They just It's just a pass along for them. I saw they built in 3% raises for the administrators. I was telling Rob, well, I'd like that. Can I, can I get that? Just, can I just pass that along? So the model is not really customer oriented. It's kind of like uh, we're letting a charter school come in our backyard and pick our pocket. And that's what they are. They're a charter school now. They don't go by that, but that is, in fact, what they are. Okay, they, we pay them a tuition. They're a public entity. We send students there for a dollar amount. And we have no control over that dollar amount either. They just send us our share, and we just blindly pay it. Well, I guess our priority then needs to be making sure that the students who we do send, that they will get the education that they need and if a student wants to go to the BCTC, but they are not clear as to what program they're going to enroll in, or we are not confident that they're going to be successful at BCTC, then we need to, uh, I guess, keep them in-house. Well, some of the model that you see, and this is not going to be solved tonight, because this is something we have to take a look at much more deeply, but some of the things you'll see is, well, we really don't know what to do with this certain subset of our population. So let's send them to Votech. Right. That's not a good answer. Votech is not easy now. Like, in the old days, there are some programs out there that, that are menial let's say. But now it's really a math-based environment. And if you don't have a math skill set, if you really don't come out of ninth grade, an algebra one type kid with a, a high C, you're probably not going to have a lot of success there either. So for us to spend seven to $10,000, you know, sending a student there without a formula for success is not good. And I have the numbers. I, you know, I've worked on these numbers. It's very difficult to get them to give us numbers. Um, and reports, and they'll, give, they'll, they'll give you a big flurry of a report, and stuff's all buried now. You got to dig it out. But um, you know, we've run the numbers, and it's around 80, 85 percent of our kids who start start there in tenth grade finish. Mm -hmm. Okay, but of that 85 percent of finish, only 85 percent get a certification. So they complete the program, but they don't pass the test. So we're looking at about a 72 percent or so success rate. And I will tell you, and I use this line; these guys laugh that. If I had a 72% graduation rate at the high school, you'd fire me, you should. Well, what okay? happens to so those students who don't get their certificates? They just graduate and they We don't know what happens another. to them? No, See, well, and that's the issue right yeah. there with Preston Tate. I mean, he's right on target with that. Like, with that level of um, getting from the beginning to the end is just not acceptable. And your analogy is hilarious. And but their sure. service point's and not good. Then when their kids are struggling. Yeah. They, I mean, they don't reach out. And, like Shelly, I don't want to say Shelly's kids, but our kids with IEPs, yeah, they may need some more support out there. And because many of the people who work in those jobs, teaching, instructing out there, many of them have a mindset they've come from industry. They're not, they haven't really been trained right. as educators, which is, that expertise is needed. But, well, in the real world, this is what happens. Well, it's not what happens in the real world. I've, I've worked in the real world. You know, there, there's lots of people behind you know, some creatives, quite frankly. Dave, you know that, not you, Dave. You so, you know, you see this, and, and the reality is that that's, that's not true. But they take this hardline stance, and then they just want to throw our kids back at us. You know, they just don't, don't. And, well, they've gotten the money, you know, for that year, and so what, they move it on. Um, so there's a whole host of kind of intricate issues that we have to solve. But I think one of the things that we ought to examine together is the possibility of having students in the ninth grade year um, who do want to go meet a certain GPA, especially in math. You got to have a certain grade math, or if it's a, I'm not saying a 3.0 or higher, I'm just maybe a 2.7 or you know, somewhere of, of, of the right. academic bookwork side, and then have them either do a presentation or a project in the high interest area. I want to go be a plumber, let me show you why, and connect it. Now, I think we can reduce this number of kids to the 70% number of success yeah. to a better number. Well, what are we going or to do? Save money. Those students who choose to go to BCTC and those students who don't do as well as they need to at the ECTC, there's no guarantee they're going to do better in Daniel Boone. Like, what, what are we setting those students up for? Because that's oh. a substantial number. Well, yeah. what we added to for the special ed students, what Megan and Preston put in place in the high school, which again, we pay more if the student has a IEP for at the ECTC, but now they set it into the schedule for one of the special ed teachers, so that's an additional uh, duty she has, but they're, they put in a uh, period so they could be supporting uh -huh. what they're doing at BCTC. So they have a period before they leave so they can bring their work there, they can 
help them. They, they check up on their grades. You know, but again, that's pulling additional resources. Well, yeah, they, they don't. We, we're paying money to this charter school right. that they don't provide a service for the kids who are going there. We provide it back at home to help them be successful. So to your point, though, what about the ones that come back? Well, you know, that's what the pathways are about. That's what's trying to find other opportunities are about. We, we do our best to match them in environments um, to support them, you know, going forward to be ready to learn when they leave. Have we done without, let's go ahead. My point, though, is without the extra seven to ten thousand dollars that they kind of, yeah, that's a year, seven to ten thousand yeah. a year. And so they come back. And they, we don't have sources that fit. Like right. I, like, if they come back, and it is an issue that they weren't properly placed or they weren't properly supported. They come back and we try to put them in courses to help them be successful at Daniel Boone if they're struggling there as well. But it becomes a big issue that what courses do we have? If this wasn't the right fit, if we didn't get it right on the front side because there weren't enough things in place, or they aren't willing to support or work with our kids. And again, we have dedicated more resources. We do a lot of things to accommodate students' schedules, defer to this class until the following year because yeah. they're, they, we have five periods with them in the day. And then the rest, they are gone. From the 11.30 until they come back to 3.10, they're gone. And if, if we can't support them, we can help them. And the other piece that hits us is they don't come back until 3.10. Our teachers are done at 3 o'clock. In the regular classroom, if they're struggling with something there, when do they get extra help? Which is what is in the special ed component as well, which is why we had to put more supports in place. Do we do any research when a student graduates from Daniel Boone? We have the rate, we know how many go to college, right? Uh, we can subtract from that and we know how many don't go to college. But after that, like uh, a year out, do we know how many are still in college? Do well, we, we have know? a tool now that Mr. Harris, uh, you know, purchased. it wasn't that expensive a way to do it. But this is the first time we have people trained on our counselors will be doing that outreach. And it's an outreach system survey. Yeah. So it's self-reported, you know, the data on that can be a little misleading. But yes, for the first time, uh, we're doing that this year and going forward. And we have mandatory and special ed. It's our year to do the lever surveys. So this is the first year. So I have to go in and go through all the students. And if they left, I have to put a check mark. And we have to reach out to those families and get contact information to then follow up next year and hope that they return the survey. I mean, Pennsylvania looks for a survey. And that's percentage. only for special education? That's for special ed. But this is a similar kind of thing that we just engage, so we're, we'll know. We'll, this time well, this is one of the things here, because how I see it, there are different categories you have. You have your Daniel Boone graduate who goes on to a four-year university or college. You have your BCTC graduate who goes on to work in their field. You have your BCTC graduate who doesn't have their certification. Well, what happens to those students? Then you have your Daniel Boone graduates who don't go on to college. What happens to those students? Do they are they working? Are so they generically? There's a couple of things. I mean, I won't say we know every student right. here. Generically, a PC, PC student who did the three years but they get the certification often goes on then to a two year tech school, mm -hmm. cosmetology, or auto mechanic school. That that happens a lot, but that costs a lot of money. I mean, that is not a cheap. So it's in the associate's degree. Um, other students go right to work. Right. Okay. So we have people who enter right into the job field. We have a high number of students who will dabble in the community college market. We'll take a course or two, um, you know, in Monaco or in Iraq. Right. So th that's kind of what happens. Um, and then we have some kids who are not doing well at all. And, and that's what I'm worried about there. What can we do to... Some, some go to military. Some do. Oh, right. Yeah. The one thing I would, I would say to you that, in addition to the many layers of this conversation, one of them is this. A student in 10th grade take, goes to BCPC for the year and decides, I don't like it, but I'm not going back. Now, scheduling that student... There's a ton of research that once a student falls two credits behind their grade level peers, they are in 50% jeopardy of not graduating in time. I haven't done the research on our kids here, but, but I, bet it's, I bet that's accurate. And then if they take the next year, we're going to ask students who technically aren't academic type personalities that in their junior now, where they used to take three academics, they're going to take seven. Mm -hmm. They've never achieved seven credits in one year in their life. Yeah. And then, you know, so this becomes a domino effect. Right. It really has to be studied more than just blindly sending our money and our kids there because the consequences are pretty, pretty good. So, have you had a conversation with uh, Ms. Twardowski, who was our representative on the I board? have had this conversation when I was having a very difficult time uh, getting data from yes. them last year. Um, I had that conversation. I did share with her my concerns that we're not having a lot of success. We're spending a lot of money. Well, that's not true. We are having success. Just there's a lot. There's not enough. 
Um, in addition, we've met, and I wasn't making as much headway as I wanted, so I brought in the big guns. Rob and Jim and I went out there, and we, we got into it with them pretty good. Uh, you know, Jim Craft and uh, Ron and Chris Hansen uh, from each of the school, not Hansen, Chris. Uh, well, Hansen. Because, you know, the, the right, the, each, each school district, were, except for Mielenberg Reading, provide a representative for that board who, you know, that board controls BCDC. Uh, my inclination is, it, it, I, I haven't been on the BCDC board, but, uh, uh, you know, and, probably like the BCIU Connor, board. Connor, you know, like the IU, whereas you probably get every district voting yes mm -hmm. for everything yep. and nobody voting no. Yep. Um, and, you know, you just don't have the time to dedicate right. to finding all the, all the nuances so you're relying on administration to, to provide the best, uh, and, and maybe they're not. Yeah. So, I mean, so if, if we're having issues too, or probably some other districts that, that maybe have some other... Well, I know Governor Mifflin has as well. Steve York had called me um, because he knew that we dismantled the model of Phoenixville and then rebuilt it to be more favorable to us. And he knew that I was pushing here a little bit because I guess it came up, uh, you know, from uh, Dr. Kraft to other superintendents. Uh, but they're pushing. Mifflin starting to push. So how many others are pushing? I don't know. And you know, I don't, I don't really care. I mean, I care about our kids and our situation here and our money. Um, and that kids get the best. Yeah, you got a lot. If you got a lot of districts pushing. Remember, you have all right. those board members who could say, right. "Wait a second, something's wrong." So to, yes. So so yeah. I haven't talked to Tamara about this in a bit. It's been it's been a couple. You know, last year for sure. She knew I was on it. Uh, that bothered me, um, and I did share that with her. And especially when I couldn't get the data, so. I don't know what came of that. She, you know, we've not had any more dialogue about, about that. So, did she follow up? Did she bring it up? Um, I do know, maybe Rob, you know, that it wasn't long after that when I said I couldn't have any success that we were able to have a meeting. Yep. So I don't know if she facilitated that. If that was just, yeah, I don't know what happened. The, one of my frustrations with that, for, first, like, at the echo what Press is saying, for, for some kids it works great, but not for all of our kids from a data standpoint. But one of the, and this is just the obvious case in point, was it last year's budget or it might have been the year before? They hired a tech coach. Okay, now that's that's a nice luxury when we can't we don't have any coaches, like reading coaches, anything. What is what is a coach in well, the what they, sense. They're there to help teachers integrate technology okay. and try to build so the skill teacher's up. teacher. Yeah, they okay. try to build skill up. There there are various things we we've had a special ed coach in our district. We've had a um, we've never had a reading is that coach. Andrea in our district. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then we had um, Met some districts have math coaches, and we're sitting there. Well, that's a luxury, and we're squeezing our bell. And that's just an easy example. We're squeezing our. That would be like our fifth choice before we we would hire a tech coach. Would be like one of our last choices, not one of our first thing. And they're doing that at the BCTC. We're funding them. Yeah. But don't get me wrong; it's a good program in terms of for some, some kids. But it seems like we're tightening our bell, right. and, and they're not tightening it. And that goes with the raises. But uh, question: So the students who we send there who do not end up succeeding for lack of a better term they um can we when we are choosing to send students there when students are choosing to go there the students who don't excel can we usually tell before they go that hey you're you're not going to do very well or is it a surprise to us because it's a surprise and i don't see much we can do i don't know that it's surprising i think it's this kind of group of students some not all of them but yeah. this group that doesn't do well or like well they haven't done well in a lot of things right why we think they're going to do this it, it kind of is analogous to the cyber school kids a parent says at some point, you know, this is, I'm going to put them in cyber school. Cyber school is the hardest one to do because mm -hmm. you don't have personal contact. So, well, they've never done well in any setting. They're not right. going to do well in cyber school either. And that's kind of the struggling group that we've had there. But at least back here, we're providing a service point to help yeah. you know, scaffold them you know, forward. And, and I don't know. I, I, Shelly, you can speak to it because it happens more the Well, I mean, that's the answer. They don't, they don't scaffold anything for our kids. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out how we can. But we need something. I know it's hard, but you do you need something for your students because while you start at the beginning of school is to educate and learn, right. unfortunately, you know, in special ed there's all this regulation, so we have the regulation now that we have to look at transition. 14 and older. We need to have a plan. So some plan. of them just need to learn a skill that right. they are they are productive and we're when they get out to and do uh, that. back down to school. I think my my point, Shell, is that if we probably disaggregate all of it. There's not a lot of success out there because of the math need for struggling right. students and students with IEPs. Some are, but, but a lot aren't. So I agree we need something, but if we see something's failed or 
failing. Right. We've got to find something better for those kids. Exactly. I don't know what it is. Okay, you know, but RAC has programs. I know we went down to Monco. There were programs. There are programs out there. What I don't understand is the relationship that we have. Like somebody explained to Jim explained this I think to me recently. Like we have some kind of commitment to that. Mm. I, I didn't realize that the years now, I mean there's some kind of commitment it's on that It's probably level. like the Wawa, like the IU code staffer. Yes, yes. I'm sure the BCC that is what it gets is. the state money. Right. Yeah. They get the state money for career education. And there's some kind of facilities. Like, we're, we're tied into their buildings. But when we, when there was a, a bond issue that all the, all the districts uh, agreed to, to float. Uh, I can tell you, we're paying every year like part of that money you know, for the, the original building or remodeling yep. of that. And we're still paying some of that. Um, we do it. There are some legal obligations in terms of low tech education, um, in terms of state mandates, in terms of what we do have to provide for our kids. Um, the, the question is is PCTC providing the right number of supports, or are, are we getting the right kids in, 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 in our need to earn? Into the Can you check in um, with Jim or whomever the uh, whoever the um, status of this agreement that we have with Montgomery is? What we have with Montgomery County Community College and RAC. Well, and RAC. Is that what you're I mean, talking about? RAC has fantastic. I mean, that, that's another. Well, yeah. Like, there's what is this agreement? And I feel like we've talked about it at the board level before entering into some type of agreement with community but colleges. But if you, if you want the RAC agreement, I need to get that in front of me. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm so, saying. Yeah, I'll get it. Can check that, please. Yeah. And there is a gateway program. Yeah, yeah, we had a college program that is a step up program for struggling students who've fallen substantially behind their credits. Right. Um, and that you know, is actually, them. it's far cheaper than PCTC to hmm. send someone there. Well, and that, I think once you get these students, almost, I look at it as like a pipeline. Like once they're in there and they have some pressure behind and then they know, like when you're maybe in 10th grade or 9th grade and you don't really know what you want to do and well maybe I'll go to BCTC well I don't like it well maybe I'll go back to Daniel right. Boom but if you get them into a, a system where there's some momentum mm -hmm. where they don't really have to make decisions it's just they're going with the flow and the decisions are being made for them and they're just learning what they need to learn that's, that's kind of what college is I guess I mean I choose see, your I major think the or right. I think our biggest issue at BCTC is cosmetology because I think these girls they know going to do hair and nails <laughs> they don't like that <laughs> yeah, and they're learning, learning about electrical Oh. Right. About all and they're like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Right. I just plug it in and it works. <laughs> exactly. Like, what do you mean have to worry about over? But I think the first step as we solve that on our on our user end is the kids got to get some skin in the game. I mean, the, yeah. the, also, they, if they're going to go there, they have to reach out and want to do it, not like default. We what else to do? With right. And so, to me, to that end, the first step is bring a little GPA requirement on that requires us to review them before we submit their application. And there should be some more understanding, I think, on their part. Hey, I'm get, this is what I'm getting into. Like, when I was a student, we had Dr. Lees came and gave a presentation in ninth grade to all the students and say, here's what BCT has to offer. And it was just pretty much, it was like an infomercial. He didn't really mention the, like, I, the cosmetology program. You're learning about all these electrical things and mathematics. and Like, make sure that they know what they're getting into and make sure they know what they're signing up for. And maybe that'll take care of some problems, but... I feel like this will be a topic of discussion. Yeah, it's so another point. Like several you have some questions. things? Okay. Yeah. Um, you said that uh, the model isn't terribly customer centric. No. Do you have an Do you have an example of something that you have requested that has been well? So, for denied? example, we, we had a girl last year. Um, you know, I'm talking about Megan. The week she came back, we helped her make it to graduation. But um, we had a girl last year who was she's a little bit of a high needs, not the most likable kid, okay? Not high academically. Right. And, and not academically, not high socially, not high friendly, not, so you know, so a difficult kid to deal with. Their model is, as soon as it goes off, they, first of all, I think they bait kids, okay, that they see as difficult or problematic or hard to handle, and they baited her a lot, um, and she would have these blow-ups, and then another blow-up, and, and then they finally just threw her out. And, you know, we don't have that luxury to throw kids out, nor should they have that luxury so when we tried to work with them to you know help understand what her challenges were, they didn't really want to hear it. Um, you know, they they throw this real world model on you. You're, you're the you're the so okay. so that's an example. Oh, there we but, go. But Shelly can give you even more. Like, we had this exploratory. It's not called that now. It's called early admissions. Well, there's no guarantee of a student was to early admissions, which is tend to be IEP kids in ninth grade. It's the only ninth graders we even entertain going there to do some exploration. Uh, to BCTC to, to check courses out. They, I think, do three or four different fields uh, when they're out there. 
and then in tenth grade they make a decision. I want to go here. Well, we might not let them in. We're going to take we're going to take your ninth grade and we'll let you come, but then we may not let you in. So to me, that again is when you're dealing with this specific population. So they're kind of pre-screening. They are pre-screening. <laughs> I think that you know, when they see the need that some of those kids come with, and it's like, yeah, no, I'm not make it. So and what did you say? So ten thousand. So we, you made it clear that you think that some kids are not in a, have not put themselves in a position to likely be successful based on how they've performed in a ninth grade class, right? What their base is. Eighth or ninth, yeah, their history hasn't shown that. I understand that they have to apply and that DCTC can say no, but can we say no? I think that's what we need to move towards. I'm just, I'm asking right, I, whether, like, if a, if a parent, because, well, Jen, Jen you just and this says, because you just you went through this a little bit. If, you so. know, if a parent makes an issue of it and says, this is what I want for my kid, do we actually have the authority to say, no, you, we can't, we're not willing to sign I, I can shed a little bit of light on that. Uh, we, we can certainly set criteria. However, we are required by law to provide vote tech education for students. Therefore, potentially, if we get challenged, potentially, if someone goes outside to find that we could be on the hook. Now, is that likely to happen? I don't think so. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. We could be I, on the hook. You understand what I'm yeah. what yeah. I'm driving at? Like, so I, can we set criteria? I understand yeah. that we can set criteria, but ultimately, mm -hmm. if somebody plays hardball enough, I think it's pretty hard. It's, it's probably it's pretty hard yeah. to. Okay. Well, sometimes that's, that's what I was right. trying to understand. And sometimes parents, like when you have criteria, we say, okay, this is the model. This has never worked for kids in our in our history. You can rationalize with parents. Yeah, yeah. Criteria too. Most parents are open to hearing what we have to say. I understand say. that. That's if, my opinion. Right? So, I agree. If so we setting criteria is not necessarily. Oh, I'm negative. And, and the thing that people that I think that the challenge is for parents is if you have a student who's academically challenged, not necessarily even having an IEP, but they have a hard time maintaining their workload as a student, and they start to fall behind at, in their regular classes, not BCTC, then when they look to BCTC, because of the requirements of those programs and the amount of time that they will not have in their day, because, let's face it, sometimes they're on the bus for half an hour to 45 minutes back to like one way to get to those locations. They don't have time to work on their assignments or things like that, so the students need to be self-motivated, and that becomes more of an issue that they aren't. And if that student fails a course in ninth grade or 10th grade and falls behind on their credits, as Preston mentioned earlier, or falls behind in their classes just academically, it is hard for them to find time in their schedules in the future to be able to make up those credits outside of a summer school or a credit recovery component. And that's hard for the parents, that's hard for the student. And they, they may very well be okay at VoTech, but if they are on a challenging be able to graduate from high school and meet the graduation requirements because for 24.5 credits, the amount of credits to fit in their day is limited. It, it becomes an issue that parents can't project, even though, well, yeah, math is hard for them, or English is hard. Like, they're always kind of walking that fine line. But that falls to us, and that's part of the conversation that I think we would like to have is have the conversation with parents. Yeah, it might be a great program. Your student might really enjoy it, but they still have to be able to maintain their academics. And here's what their day really looks like as part of the conversation that we're working on presenting it and outlining for the parents. Because, again, we want all students to be successful in all classes and successful for the future. But how do you fit that into their day? It's a challenge. As the scheduler, right. like, many, where are they fitting? Where are they going? What are they going to happen? How, how many do we, we have to go in the West because the, the, the offerings are not over here? 27. 27, 27 kids going to the West, and we have 89 kids right now going to the East. Um, I have two, two more questions. The uh, if we send the kid and they come back, whether it be at the kid's behest or at BCTC's behest, do we do they prorate the? You know, we pay to send them. Do they prorate the portion so of the year and pay us easily back? Easily attainable. Um, we tried to get that answer directly. Um, I've gotten two answers. Yes. No. So I don't have the truth. Okay, so you don't um, have both it. answers from two different sources on that. So. Okay. Well, you know what we know, obviously, is Lauren and the business, because they send the money. I can tell you, though, because I look at that, and that line's way over for us this year. We are spending about a million dollars, not counting Shelly's budget on kids. About a million dollars we spent. Okay. 
Okay. Big chunk. I, I'll ask Lauren about that. And finally, um, do you know how they rationalize having kids graduate from BCTC without a certificate? Like, if you haven't done the work to complete whatever program it is that you're in, how do you, how can somebody graduate yeah. from BCTC? Like, I don't understand how that's... If they haven't done the work for us, then they don't graduate, right? I, well, I think in, in many of the shops, there's multiple certificates. Mm -hmm. Like, in, I know in auto. So they might say, oh, you know, you they earned, and I know one of my he earned, like, the oil changing. He can change oil. Well, that's what more, he did. That's what he learned in four years. You got the certificate where he could work in, like, a gym. Right. But there are really two certificates that you're really trying to get that will set you up for an opportunity, okay? So one is passing the NACI, and then the other one is called the PA skills, okay? Which means you were advanced on the NACI, you scored in the highest range, mm. which represents, you know, a certain level of competency to employers. Well, how do, how do employers, like, if I went to BCTC and I wanted to work at Jiffy Loop, how would they take my, like, do we have any idea how they hire? Like, do they know, like, with the PA Nocti? Yes. They, yes. they have all yes. that. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. So this but the other certification one might be a different level. They may not give. And some of that, <laughs> that's the you know, self esteem world we live in. One kids to feel good about achieving right. some things along the way. But I don't know that it really turns into employable opportunity. If, now, the Nocti stuff does, and the pay skill cert does. And there's some situations where if that student didn't sign up or get into the program they wanted for 10th grade, then they change programs. Right. They may not be able to finish the certification program within their high school career. Correct. So we may graduate based on their credits, but then BCTC will say, or they'll ask for more time, or they will say, you can come back here next year, but you have to pay out of pocket. Right. Or, you know what, they can still be educated via their IP until the age of 21, send them back again for another year. Right. And then that's a whole other... They got a, they got a heck of a thing going, guys. Yeah. They got um, a heck of a model. <laughs> it's killing us. But, yeah. I know, guys, I actually have this have report I, I can send to you if you want. Yeah, this this is BCTC. Program. I'm sorry. And the Service Office is the Work Partners Program are really ideal programs for our special needs they really do do the job for this money. Yeah. And they're, okay. we're there for our students who are in life skills right. and are very needs, are very little. Well, so would it be fair to characterize the status quo in your view is not working? Oh, I, I don't know. I mean... It's not a good return on investment, I'll say that. Well, because that's what I'm trying to get at, because we've talked about yeah. this now for a few years, even, sure. this issue, and I'm trying to figure out what the way forward is. Well, I think the way forward is, like I said, to just increase the criteria to entrance on our side so we can get the right kids going, okay? Um, and I think, like, for example, if we have 100 kids, we actually have a little more, let's say 100. And let's say we, we, we do what we're saying, where we put some criteria, a math criteria, and uh, or a GPA criteria, and a project. Well, some kids aren't going to meet that. Right. And those kids are the kids who likely aren't going to have success there. And then, to Shelley's point, we have to find another program that supports them. It's not like we just, that's it, kid, you're out of luck. Yeah. We have to find the right program for them. So maybe we go from having, you know, 100 kids going there to 80, and we still lose 10 along the way. But, you know, getting that number to a more realistic, better return on our investment model, I think is, is the right well, way forward. Also, getting those students who wouldn't have succeeded there in all likelihood anyway, getting them into a path that they would succeed. So we have to find what that program is. I just want to make sure if, if, if we down the road do have criteria that we make sure it's, it's the right criteria. Right. And then that takes because, because, yeah, I mean, if, right. okay, I, I, I might need to do some math work. I want to be a chef. Right. But, you know, not necessarily. I mean, I, right. maybe the recipe needs to do some stuff, right. but, but, you know. Right. And, that, and that's a great point, David. I think we have to take some time really to look at what how we would do that. I, mean, I don't think we just broad brush something, but it would take some, a real investment. If that's the direction this committee and, and administration want to go. Yeah, I don't want to see another issue where a kid, they need a 78 to get into the BCTC and they get a 75 or a 77. Yeah. Um, and we, and we say, nope, have to, door closed. We're, we're, we, we changed at the high school from prerequisites to recommendations as it is. Right. Um, because ultimately our mindset is that if a parent wants to do it, a student wants to do it, we don't want to be a barrier to making it happen. But even once it happens, though, I think it's important that this, there be follow-up. Like, there's a student who's borderline. Well, yeah. how are you doing a few months in? Everything's going well. Like, have a conversation with them and make sure that they understand, hey, we're, 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 we agreed. We, got, we we had a discussion. We were kind of trying to come to a conclusion as to whether this was a good course or not. We decided to, you wanted to do it. Now, um, here's where you stand, and that's uh, not I'm enough. I'm curious on that payment number, because... 
I, I always thought we, we pay like a, an average of three progress. years. You do. Going That's back true. and whether they're there or not. Like just where it plays out, Dave, is, is three, four more years down the road. Yeah. And that's exactly, I was just with the guy from Phoenixville who like engineered that model, and now it's returning about $2.7 million a year for them on a three-year average model. So you don't yield it next year, but you do yield it on a three-year running average, and that's a substantial amount. I mean, Phoenixville is the same size as we are. $2.7 million a year, I think we can find out. What's their budget? The budget is $86 million. It's nice to have those 2.7 still 2.7. Yeah. <laughs> so, but there are, it's not, there are sort of two issues, right? One of them is perhaps we're not doing a good enough job with the appropriate selection criteria and, and education about what goes in, like what's going to be involved and what the difficulties will be with the, with the program based on the additional travel time and so forth, and the, the educational time that you lose because you are... There's extra transit and so forth, right? So there's, that, there's, that's one piece. But the other piece is the, mod, the is the fact that they're not very responsive. To, they don't seem to be terribly concerned with our needs, right? So, so obviously we can I'm saying that allows the most. I think you know others. That's how I feel about it. And I feel strongly about it. I don't know if others agree with that. I mean, I don't want to be the only voice that says that. So if, if it's just me, then it's just me. I'm sorry. I I'm trying. The, the it customer seems to me that there's part. two issues, right? That one is we're not doing a, maybe we're not doing a good enough job selecting the kids and explaining to them what the difficulties will be because of the extra, because of the lost educational time due to extra transit and so forth and so on, right? So that's one side. But the other side is Preston seems to think that. BCTC doesn't seem to care very much about what we think the difficulties are with the existing model. Um, it, so what I'm trying to find out, Preston is saying he doesn't want to be, if, if he's the only one who thinks that, he thinks maybe it's no, just he's him. He's not in isolation. I, I think there, there are some service points. I mean, like we had to pull teeth last year to get data from them, which that, that, they should have had that kind of stuff at the tip of their fingers. Yeah. Um, that, that was one particular point. The, the graduation rate, as to Preston's point there, is not where it needs to be from where a kid's coming in. Now, I also need to say, I, I think Vote Tech provides the valuable kids with valuable skills for our community in terms of I, being I, able to get jobs. Yeah, and yeah. so, and that, that would be the positive. And so, we'll, we're looking at those numbers right, right there. And then the other source, of, and I said this already, source of my frustration, I feel like we're, we keep tightening our belt tighter and tighter right. and tighter. And yeah, I, that's I a terrible model. Yeah, and I'm like, but, are you kidding? I don't yeah, think anyone is disputing yeah. that it's a value add. I think yeah. what we're questioning is are we getting the return on our investment that we should be getting? Not is it actually adding value, but is it is it adding value commensurate with how much we're investing in? It's it's a that's great the question. question. I think parents could be with that too, because not only are we paid, parents have to pay lots yeah, of fees, and they have to pay for uniforms, well, they have to buy well, books. And they're essentially paying it, right? I mean, to the, to the, yeah, the extent that we're doing it, the no, taxes go up as our budget increases. No, 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 what she's saying is there's not only the tax cost, the no, no, but there's the add-on cost. I understand okay. that, but so they're paying they're paying twice, right? right. It's hitting them right. two ways, right? They're paying tax increases that right. support the programs and whatever additional ancillary right. and costs no help are. For needy students who can't afford it. I mean, that comes again from back to Preston's guidance fund, who have they bought uniforms and books and things for students? So they have no. There's no sliding scale for. Yeah, like we're talking about the uh, laptop uh, covers and protectors. And, right. You know, the, the, there's no free reduce use number. Okay. So and, they, um, they, they don't cater to that population at all. That's, again, that's, one, yeah, that's once again, to me, that's a model that's just not. Right. And I, I don't know how you, I, I don't know how you can be a school and not, I don't know how you can call yourself a school and not make some effort I, I'd be to curious make sure what that their, what their poverty number is. I bet you it's pretty good. I bet you it's pretty good. I bet it's pretty good. Well, and one thing that I know that I've come across that is a frustration for me, though I appreciate it from their standpoint, well, you're just one of 16 districts. Right. You're just like, so it's like our voice doesn't matter because we're one asking for this. Like, well, what do you mean? You know, well, I appreciate that. Like, taking attendance on the bus. Like, mm -hmm. can you make sure the bus drivers take attendance because we have a couple different issues going on? Well, why should we do that? Like, well, don't you want to know who's on your bus? Well, nobody else does that. Everybody else did. Are there meetings of, like, county high school principals? Like, the, well, yeah. I can actually be mind if I speak to this. We actually, um, middle school principals in the county, we meet four times a year. 
We were supposed to meet last Tuesday. We were meeting at BCTC to express our concerns <laughs> oh. that they don't seem to want to listen to uh, the districts and, and what we're looking for and what we need. Um, so we had actually set that up. We're trying to reschedule it for in May. But um, so it is a concern across the board. And you might wonder, well, why why are middle school principals involved? Well, a lot of districts in the county actually do a lot of their BCTC, their visit and their talk in middle school. So a lot of my fellow principals, that's happening in middle school instead of in high school. Right. So, but they've been experiencing a lot of pushback. Like, for example, the only time that they're willing to come in and do the talk is during PSSA. Well, that obviously is not acceptable, but they're not willing to budge because that's what works for them. So I was actually really looking forward to sitting in that because I wanted to hear, too, what other districts were experiencing because they had expressed that before, which is why we asked to meet there. Um, I can say that I think there are a lot of things going on at the high school now to better support those kids. I mean, if we can put criteria in place and those kids don't meet that criteria, and now that the Pathways model is in there, there's a lot of opportunity for them to find something else where they can be successful. So I think the way that the high school is designed is much better now to support them than in the past when it was like, well, you didn't get in, so there Sorry. you go, have yeah. fun. <laughs> general, general end, good luck. Yeah. Like, I get the end of a pathway for some of those pathways will be that these kids get low level, you know, introductory, I should say, not below, introductory job experiences, let's say that, that um, and internships and things like that. So, yeah, thanks, man. That's, you know, that's the goal. You know, we have to do some more work there to make the career piece happen. Um, and, and to that end, we tried to partner with BCTC. Um, I went over to West to meet with, with I want to say your name, Chris Hansen. Um, because what we felt with the pathways is that they can offer an every other day model, a we cut transportation costs for us, we can get some internship pieces. And you know, Chris was a super nice guy, um, you know, listened nicely, but that was the end, never, never, no more came about it. Um, you know, Jim had talked about, because we have space in the district, Harris, that maybe we can have an outreach program here. Like, they, they're not gonna do that I'm not suggesting that we should do this, but you said we have a commitment some sort of thing. Do we have the option to pull out if we decide that? I, I mean, I just, I'm just really, trying to... We, well. have a, we have a contract with them um, right now, and then, like I said, we're still paying on, um, so we're, on. There, we're still paying on the debt there, um, and that debt was divided among the school districts in person. But that's a separate issue. Yeah, the debt. Right. I mean, if we decided for whatever reason that yeah. we could get a lot more bang for our buck somewhere else, we might be willing to just keep paying the debt piece and Send them somewhere else. So, I mean, if we well, decided can, that can, was in the best, give a rain to Reading Muhlenberg. We had some conversations with, and, and Ron, you were part of this when we went down to uh, Jim to, to uh, Montgomery County and over to Rack. And the, it's interesting. The community colleges are a little leery too about stepping on not only each other's steps, but on the BCT you know, because they have a relationship with those guys. I'm sure they have a lot of kids that come come. Over. Yeah, it's, so it, it's all interwoven. Yeah. Um, but but you but they'll do it. Hey, listen. <laughs> They'll do it. I met with, uh, what's her name, Megan? The uh, lady who's out from dual enrollment. Anyway, she comes down, if you remember, yelling out. But she comes down and, and she, uh, you know, she will like sit on the side talk to me about these ideas. Mm -hmm. Jody Corbin, that's it. She'll talk about these ideas on the side, but she's got to be careful. So. All right. We talked about this a lot, yeah, and it's important. But we need to move on. A uh, few minutes left. And we also have to talk about the marching band curriculum at the high school. That's not on here. Uh, but number five, funding sources discussion and HR 610. Yeah, I, I just need one minute of your time. Yeah. I, I don't want to set off alarm bells, but I, I just want to make you aware of discussions because there is potential implications. Um, the This is federal funding. There is a portion of our budget that we do get from the federal government, and Lauren's aware of this also. Um, the uh, Irregardless of politics or anything else, um, there, there, HR Bill 610 um, is out there, and it involves school choice, um, it involves federal programming. We do get money from federal programs. Um, we get uh, roughly about $420,000, $430,000 from the federal government. Um, the, if 
some of these bills and or variances of these bills eventually pass, it could have an effect on, on us and our budget. I just want to make you aware. The, uh, access money could also be an area where we get. Yeah, they, we get absolutely. And you know, you're talking about Title One, Title Two, II, Title Three, Title Four funding, and certainly special ed. Most of our funding, let's be clear, most of our funding is state and local oriented. However, there is if there is real the, money there. Guys. When we spoke, I asked if you could get like a pie chart or something together showing that breakdown between local, state. And yeah, we funding. get our our budget for next year. Year is 65% local, 33% state, 1.21% federal. Okay. I believe that's where they're okay. approximately roughly rounded, obviously. Give me a rough idea. All right. Okay. Just wanted to make you guys aware. Uh, stay tuned. Um, it's all politics right now. It's all going around. Just want to make sure. But you'll make sure we know if we have to do anything? Yeah, I'll okay. make sure. It's floating out there, that's for certain. All right, next up is a topic that I had an idea, and maybe it's uh, worth going somewhere with, maybe it's worth dropping right now. Um, looking through the survey, and I had this idea before I saw the survey, um, when we were going and touring the uh, String Theory School in Philadelphia, I spoke to some teachers, and they had mentioned how there really isn't any uh, opportunity for discussing the things that we talk about, at least in this committee, and whenever there's, uh, in their opinion, or at least in one teacher's opinion, whenever there's something set up like the advisory committee, it's almost as if the end has been determined, and the question is just, how do we get there? And sometimes it's seen, in, at least in, through the, in the eyes of one teacher, um, just kind of justifying a decision that's already been made. And I don't know how widespread this belief is. Looking at the survey, one of the areas of, uh, I don't know if I have the, the right page here, um, but something like, it was an overwhelming number of staff disagreed that they had any input on uh, when it comes to stuff like we discuss here, curriculum. Uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think the, the, the common, common thread you saw was not enough teacher input. Right. Um, again, I mean, I, you know, I don't know, did only the people who are responsible do the survey yeah. and... Uh, but it was definitely t teacher input. Um, uh, I think also the other common thread I saw was um, uh, proper in-service you know, training, and, and which maybe our calendar for next year might you know, might address that, that yep. issue. And, uh, well, my idea here, but if I can have it, having teachers, yeah, you know, and probably one of it stems back to the fact that you know we we we, we hadn't been. Paying teachers extra for curriculum writing, right? I mean, we, we it's, it's in the contract, but we've been kind of working around it by having them do it during normal. Or we try as many. We try to look at our budgets. We try to do the best we can with what we got. <laughs> so well, honestly. the reason I wanted to bring this up was um, I had mentioned this before to the administration many times. How in the past it was like all the ideas seemed to be coming at least in the committees, the board committees, from some board members and. I like the um, the one-to-one -one initiative, how it came from the administration. But none of, none of the people in this room have monopolies on, on ideas, and certainly good ideas, and we have hundreds of people out there in the district who I think they they interact with these students every day, they're on the front lines, and I think that they could have some worthwhile feedback and ideas. Yeah. Um, so my idea is I'd like to do a little pilot, if the committee will indulge it. Um, Prior to these meetings, so after pretty much when the school day ends, except a little bit later, it might be like 4 o'clock or 4.30, we can have, it will pretty much be open to any teacher who wants to come, and they, we sit around this table and we just have conversations about things going on in the schools and ideas. Um, there wouldn't be any expectation necessarily that we'd follow up on their ideas, but... Um, well, that's the problem, Connor. So the disgruntled people that you were talking to, because we took the good disgruntled people on that trip intentionally, um, there's been a shift, obviously, at the high school from committees making decisions to committees making recommendations. Right. And, you know, that, that's all of us. We put a lot, like, just, just like our group, we, we make a recommendation about the one to one, you guys can say no. And that's a very hard pill for teachers in any district to swallow, in my experience, not just here. Um, so they're very accustomed to making decisions. Right. Um, and that's, you know, there's so many more things that go into the decision than what they see. I mean, a teacher has to see it like this, building administrator like this, essential administrators are like this, and the board has to see all of it. And when you don't accept it, and every committee that we lead, we say, 
you're in this committee together, you're going to make a recommendation to help that. And then if it's not, they say, well, then I'm not working on committees anymore because we didn't do what I said. Like right now, at the high school, we have, Megan, I think the number is about 30, if I count the people on the, on the subcommittees, the steering subcommittees for curriculum instruction. So there's 30 people in that building out of 70 teachers who are on committees working and making decisions in the building. Well, what does, uh, like, I, it was news to me when I heard that there was a, I heard there was another curriculum and instruction committee. One of the teachers mentioned, oh, yeah, I signed up to be on the curriculum and instruction committee. That's, that, that's, in, that's in the building. But I was, what does that committee do? What that committee does is we're looking right now for them to make a recommendation, okay, design some things about where they think the curriculum want to go, engage them on how it, their ideas fit into the pathways model, and then the, well, you will get a document here in this committee from us, um, you know, after it's vetted through Rob and Jim and those guys, about this is what the teachers think the direction of it, how the building want to be, curriculum, instructionally, sa school safety, and uh, scheduling, and um, student services. So there are five subcommittees in the building, and they're working on that, and that recommendation will come to you. And, I, and it's good that we're bringing their views in at the building mm -hmm. level, but I'm wondering here, in terms of just a free discussion of ideas, um, some of which, I mean, maybe, you know, pie in the sky, some of which could be as simple as, maybe starting the day five minutes later than we do now. Maybe there's a reason for that. I don't know. But what if we had a platform where any teacher could come in and we could talk about these things without any expectations for, um, you know, necessarily action or inaction, but it would be a, an opportunity to interface board or at least curriculum committee and frontline staff. Is there, before hearing from the administration, is there any, do you think there'd be an appetite for that? Um, I have, obviously don't have any objection to that, but what I'm struggling with is... Is this not that? I'm just asking, hypothetically, I'm just asking the question. Yeah, if someone they, they had could, an could idea, come, right? okay, I'm not disputing that, the fact that all those seats are empty, but if somebody wanted to bring something to this committee, have we ever said, you can't come and bring your ideas here? And like I said, I'm, just, I'm not trying to be argumentative. Well, we, we, can I'm trying, you know, we can put a shroud over them and muffle their voice. And <laughs> don't don't discount and, uh, that there are some people who are comfortable being claiming that they're disenfranchised so they can disown any decision. Of course. And so, but the folks in our building who want to have a voice, there are 30 of them having a voice. But I mean, right. you and certainly if, can do it, but I don't want you to get disheartened or if they don't show up. Any right? of them because that are on the existing subcommittees in your building, I don't know if the other buildings have them or not, but any of those people would be welcome in this room anytime to, right. to suggest anything, right? I mean, I don't... And any of those people also have, they know that... Um, they, they, we don't select them. They, they volunteer. Right. I, mean, so my, I think my point is just perhaps it, it's as simple as saying, we know that you have good ideas, and we would like to hear from you at these meetings. That's part of the reason that we have them. You haven't shown up, so we haven't discussed them. But if you did, we'd be happy to. Yeah. And that's not to say that we would act on everything, but at least we would know that this stuff is going on and that, of course, we know that the people in the district have ideas, but we would at least hear them and have a chance well, to evaluate. what if we set aside, let's say, instead of doing a whole separate little subcommittee here, what if, let's say, maybe not next month, but the month after, we set aside maybe an hour of time on the agenda and we send out a district, an email to teachers in the district, hey, if you haven't been to a curriculum instruction committee meeting before, come on out. There is some free time set aside where we can talk about these ideas and... Um, Punch cookies? There is an idea. Maybe we can get pizza. I don't know. That's something that Rob can look into. Um, <laughs> oh. It's on your personal, personal credit card. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> but uh, maybe that's something that we can do before, and we can see and if people show up. Because, you know, if you're going to complain, if we're giving you an opportunity to weigh in and you choose not to take advantage of it, and then you complain, I mean... Uh, do you understand my point? That I, no, I understand. I, sort of, yeah. like but the, I, I do disagree not, a little bit. I'm not bit. objecting with the, to the subcommittee yeah, no. thing. I just feel like there is already an avenue for people to come to us with ideas. I, I do wonder there, though, just thinking kind of, uh, this is yeah, a yeah. subcommittee of the board, and I wonder, like, my understanding, at least through these meetings, and depending on, like, if we had 50 people show up and we had an hour and 30 minutes, I'd limit comment probably to residents only, because that's how the board does it. It's not... And teachers aren't necessarily residents. So I didn't necessarily look at it the way that you're looking at it, that anybody could come and really have a, a discussion like we're having right now with the administrators. Um, if you just put on the agenda, you know, um, what I call teacher, teacher ideas and thoughts, you know, and just have a standing, standing agenda item, item and, and invite people to it. Yeah, that's an idea, yeah. too. I, mean, I, I so certainly would be... You have to keep it structured. Yeah. I think when you leave it, I mean, it's nice to leave it open, but if you don't, then you're just going to get it. 
complaining. Right. But, but yeah, but if we most like, of our board meetings are carved anyway. out a certain amount of time so at every meeting that would be dedicated to this if people showed up, right? And that people knew that it doesn't matter where you live, right? If you yeah. work in the district and you have an idea and you show up, there's yeah, because uh, I certainly for this meeting I don't care where people live. Like to, if people are going to take time out well, of I mean, when it's, when there's nobody their here, own right. time yeah. to show up here and pitch an idea, but I'm certainly going to listen. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, maybe an idea there is uh, I can put on the agenda. Maybe we'll start a 15-minute block, so we'll be sure to finish up 30, 15 minutes before we normally do. And if people are here and want to talk, then, they, then we can do that. But you, Otherwise, you might want to put continue. it out to the general teacher population. So oh, right. Yeah. Would, yeah, no, we will have to. Could, we, could I send out an email? Saying that this is the new. Yeah. Okay. I think that would look really nice coming from you, actually. <laughs> I think it would too. But I'll, I'll run it by Mike just to see what's going on there. But, um, okay. Get, get this marching band. Yeah, let's do that quickly. I was glad. I don't know if. Uh, sorry I didn't send out the attachment. Uh, I was sending it from my phone and I didn't uh, attach it, but we got that squared away. I like that curriculum that came out. That looks good. Um, my questions, I. That's our signal that it's time to go. Yeah. A few. My philosophical question, I guess, is we often categorize marching band as a sport, and I don't have any dog in that fight. Same thing with cheerleading and all that. I don't really care. But how is marching band different in this respect from football? Like, they're, like why, why are we giving a half credit for marching band and not for football? Because they're a strong advocacy group and they want it. That's kind of <laughs> that's not the answer that's, I wanted to hear. But here's the deal. I, I think that it's not bad. It's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Just like I would think it'd be bad to have a sport team have some opportunity to do that, but I'm not, not pushing for it. But um, I did talk with Erin Ben today uh, about this as, as our leader yeah. in the music, and she kind of clarified some things for me because I'm not very in tune. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> so. <laughs> Look at me. Yes, <laughs> yeah. But what happens is um, symphonic and, um, wind and the wind ensemble, they um, in the past were part of that time. So what would happen is marching band would not really have a curriculum, as you kind of said, but they would be in the fall, okay, and they would practice their music for that. Then in the uh, winter, they, uh, wind ensemble and, and symphonic would practice the winter concert during that time and then in the spring they would practice the spring concert so that's kind of the what, what they were doing before um, the one thing I told her is that we are not having conversation or interested in requiring kids Good. to be in marching band to be in, we're not going to hold kids hostage mm -hmm. so that that was part of that that conversation um, as we were going forward and then she she wasn't aware of where you could find curriculum and I just when I sent you I Google yeah um, you know and Pretty base, and you can see it was only you know a short time. It's not a lot there, but it's up, it ends up being about a quarter. You know, well, then, maybe a third so there year. were three issues I saw. Well, four, I guess, including that philosophical one. But first was this issue of how would the grading work? Because I mentioned before when I was, did the program, it was if you don't show up to two competitions and you lose a letter grade. Right. And to me, that's entirely unacceptable because there are legitimate reasons for being unable to to go to Mechanicsburg to be in a marching band competition. Right. Um, so I'm glad to see that it's more focused on the learning of the instruments and all that, and I hope you can assure me that it wouldn't be a situation where you could lose. I don't want it to be a participation grade that it's going to impact the students' GPA. I have to have more conversations with those guys for sure. I mean, I, you know, okay. this was a quick turnaround on this. Um, I don't want to represent this as a done piece. Yeah. Um, it's not. Second up here, um, let's say a student signs up for marching band in ninth grade. Um, it's on their... It's in the system, they're in the 0.5 credit class. Let's say they lose interest in the middle of the summer. Let's say they lose interest in the middle of the fall. And because it is a lot of it out of school, they don't want to participate. Are they going to have to get a zero on their report card then, and that's going to bring down their GPA? So I think I, your, your question about the grading model has yeah. to be worked out. I don't think okay. we have good answers. Well, then let me give you my answer there. I'd hope, like, if there's a student who wants to give marching band a try, they because uh, it is a major time commitment, and they decide, no matter when in the season, that they are not interested in continuing. Uh -huh. 
I don't want them to be held hostage by if they drop out, then their grade is going to be a zero. It's more likely we would replace them in a study hall. Than okay. Be sitting there just scrapping. I just don't want. I don't want it to. Case. I don't want them to. Like I. I want to encourage students to take these courses, especially music courses. Um, but I don't want them to. Uh, I don't want to hurt them if they decide it's not for them. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the other question I think was. I mean, that was the big thing, just the flexibility there. I don't want this to be you're locked in and you have no choice. If you want to play an instrument, you have to be in it. So I'm, I was very reassured to see that curriculum. But the question, though, of um, maybe a phys ed credit could be awarded for sports or yeah. something. Because I, I don't like that idea that because there are some vocal people, some of whom are on the board, who want to give credit for this, it, we just got to do it. And I don't know. It's just like you can't have your cake and eat it, too. We talked about this in the extra curriculum. Getting credit, uh, credit for a sport is it's a complicated piece to go through. Not that we shouldn't investigate it, but it's just it's not an easy one. So uh, they did it right. Yeah, I know that, that was that was brought up a couple of years ago as a way to save money. Yeah. Well, if the kids take a sport, why do they have to take a gym? We can cut cut yeah. you know, cut cut gym down. Yeah. It, it's not a clean, easy deal. So you have to go through PD. There, there are steps you have to take there. My only other comment with regard to your philosophical question or two. Um, and I think your answer is fine because I, because I live in the real world, and we all know that ad, Some of us are powerful ad, advocacy groups do have <laughs> do have a bearing on what is and isn't available for certain groups of people in all, um, in all forms of life. I would I would argue that a lot more, a lot higher percentage of the kids who participate in marching band here go on to participate in marching band in college than athletes do. Uh, because large for a lot of reasons, but one of which is, as a general rule, when you, if you go on to uh, if you want to be in marching band in college, there's no cuts, right? So people, everybody who wants to participate can, right. as opposed to when athletic, athletics are not structured that way. So these kids are developing a skill that they're much more likely to take. Well, then, to let, let me just switch that up. Let's say academic challenge at the high school. Like, that is, you can participate in that for co in college without there being any cuts. And there's more, I'd say, intellectual even than some of the other groups. Why don't we award academic credit for that club? I, I would, actually, <laughs> uh, as a former captain of the Daniel Boone High School academic challenge team. But, all right. Well, I, I'm glad we you gave me some reassurance there. We can keep talking about these things. But if there's no other comment on this topic... Um, well, I, I, I think you, you're hopeful that the, the, the board will vote on this at the voting meeting, right? So we, the marching band piece? Because you need, need to need get to that. If we're going to schedule you need meeting. to get that into the... Into yeah, we're ready to start running the schedule. Well, I'd like if you can have some more answers on the grading component. On the grade piece. Okay. Yeah, and we could talk about that if need be offline. But. All right. Well, if nobody else has any comment on the Curriculum and Instruction Committee meeting, we will adjourn at 7.05. Right. Thank you.